Hey everyone, this is Kyle from The Art of Physical Fitness, and I'm here today with an interview with Kelly Davis. Kelly, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kelly Davis of Mother Fitness, and I welcome you to our interview. So Kelly, what? tell us a little about yourself for those who don't know you. What makes Kelly Davis, Kelly Davis? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I really started Mother Fitness because I got into the online community of fitness and nutrition for women and I thought that there was sort of um, this divide of how to achieve the goals that we were we were seeking as far as getting in shape and being healthy right. and managing everything else in our lives. So being a busy mom, a career woman, um, and how do all these pieces fit together? So that's sort of what drove me to starting Mother Fitness and building this platform where women could feel like, you know, I don't have to train constantly and starve myself to death and, you know, go right. crazy trying to do all these things. And I wanted to have sort of that, that atmosphere where it, women can learn how to fit these things into their life um, rather than trying to mold their life around fitness and health. That's awesome. I love that message. Uh, yeah, for me, that's the same deal. I used to be real serious about it and used to control my life. And then it got to a point where it was just a breaking point where I couldn't have that anymore. And had to learn yeah. how to adapt to it and adapt how to make life a priority and realize that fitness is actually in health, nutrition, all that. It's more a part of it's an all-encompassing thing as opposed to something that everything needs to be focused on, if that makes any sense. My ramblings make sense. Yeah, and when your friends stop calling you and they don't right. invite you out more, that's got to be a sign. You right. Know, you're, a little, you're a little diehard and you need to back off. So um, I was reading over your bio on your website, looking at your background where you talked about it. Uh, briefly go into that, and I know you in it you talked about there was a low point for you um, that basically triggered you to start making changes, and then there was why when you started to make the changes for a healthy lifestyle, there's another point where you – um, sort of came to a pass where you knew you had to change even further. Yeah, absolutely. I um, It was after I had my second child, and with my son, even before I got pregnant with him, I, I kind of fell out of the gym routine. I was busy with my daughter and work, and I let everything else kind of overwhelm me. Right. And um, by the time I got pregnant with my son, I had already gained... I had already weighed more than I had ever weighed. I wasn't significantly overweight, but you know, I probably was carrying an extra 10 pounds. And then through my pregnancy with him, I didn't work out at all. I had a high risk pregnancy. Um, I gained a substantial amount of weight. And after I had him, a lot of it didn't come off. And I was sort of stuck in this mode. Well, you know, it's true, kids ruin your body. Right. You know, this is my mom body. I'm just stuck with that. And I was really good at making all these excuses. Um, as to why I, I was this way. And I would sort of venture back into the gym and get on the treadmill. And all, all I would think about is, oh, I'm not in the shape I used to be. You know, I could feel the fat jiggling on my thighs when I walk. And it was just like everything that, every way that I could potentially talk myself out of being there, I would do. And I sort of came to this realization that I was miserable. And I was the one creating this misery so I was the only one that could change it. And um, that was sort of my aha moment where like, okay, you don't have to live like this. You're, right. you're making this life for yourself and you're the one who needs to make a difference. And so I started going to the gym and I dedicated myself. I would take fitness classes and I would hide in the back of the room, um, you know, panting the whole way through, right. like ready to pass out after 20 minutes. And there are these like, 75 year old women in front of me just going at it. What so, classes were you doing? Um, I took body pump twice a week and then I would take a yoga class twice a week. Now what's body pump? I am not familiar with much of the classes, if you will. Yeah, I took it at the YMCA and body pump is a Les Mills class and it's sort of, um, it's a weightlifting class but it's a lot of endurance weightlifting. Okay. So rather than, you know, when you're doing a strength routine doing X amount of reps, you're like, right going for a certain amount of time. Okay. So you do like a bazillion squats. And, okay, it wasn't that many, but it felt like <laughs> it. Um, so that was kind of my getting back into it and I dedicated myself and the more that I went, I like 
slowly made it up to the front of the classroom and you know I made it through the whole class and I got stronger and you know I just I kept going from there like from that moment I think my son was two and a half I never stopped going to the gym like that was you know I've taken some weeks off or yeah slowed down at certain points but I never like stopped going right and that, I mean, that's important what you're saying there is where your life had to fluctuate and your training had to fluctuate it's not full bore all the time it's take the gas let off the gas pedal sometimes press the gas down slam it down at other times when you're raring to go um yeah. so how many kids do you have now is that your I last two. my daughter's oh. nine and my son is six okay okay um so you once you started getting to and you started getting into exercising more and nutrition you went on you've competed correct with bigger competitions i did um we moved from the YMCA, my husband and I were, you know, it was a small YMCA, it was the oldest one where we lived, and it was a very small gym, so the more he and I got into weightlifting, we wanted a bigger gym, and we started going to a local gym that was known for powerlifting, um, and they had everybody there, I mean, there was all, all walks of life there, but they had a lot of the equipment that powerlifters used, and you know, you see these guys in there doing like these insane lifts, and yeah. It's really motivational. I talked to them about, you know, how to do front squats and learning all these different things that I had never even seen before. Right. And there was also like a small um, faction of bodybuilders and uh, bigger competitors. And when I was in college, I that's when I first learned about bigger competitors. It was kind of new. I guess it really started in the 90s and, you know, so by the time I was in college, it was picking up a little bit, but it wasn't like it is today. Um, and I thought they were like this elite group of women. I wanted to be one, but I thought, you know, right. they were born that way. And um, So I never pursued it. And then I started meeting these women in my gym that were moms and bigger competitors. And I'm like, okay, I'm already reaching my goal of being the best in the best shape of my life. By the time I'm 30, now it's time to like take it a step further. And so this became my new goal. And go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Now, um, I know you talked about it a little bit um, was it from your article or on your bio. Your bio, I know um, you were talking about how when you started getting a physical competition, it started to take over your life, and you started depriving yourself of food. You started feeling like your health was just falling apart. Is care to elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. And um, from the time I decided to sign up for a show and do my first show. It was, I probably had like 11 weeks from, you know, that initial, I'm going to do this to the day I walked on stage. Right. And I, I went about it myself for a few weeks and I was just totally lost because I was in all these forums and everyone's giving you advice and, you know, I'm taking all this advice and I'm just doing everything wrong in my mind. So I hired somebody to help me and they were pro bodybuilders and not always the best. Who was that in the background? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, who was that in the background? What dog was that in the background? Huh? Who was that in the background? The furry friend you oh, had walking by? My dog. <laughs> What's his name or her name? Max. Max, all right. Yeah. Go on. Uh, um, so I was on this very low cal diet. I was eating, you know, chicken and tilapia and asparagus and like very minimal foods. Mm -hmm. And I lost a ton of weight really quickly. By the time I got on stage, I was 117 pounds, and I probably hadn't weighed that since my junior year in high school. Right. Um, so I got really lean, and you know, I, I looked like a fitness model, but I felt like garbage. I was always grumpy. I felt run down. I felt consumed with my diet and my training, and you know, I was constantly in the gym. Like I'd get home from work, and I'd rush my kids off to the gym, and you know, like I had no family time. I had, I was so consumed by this that it had sort of taken over who I was. Right. Um, so after I did that show, I sort of reevaluated everything and I started reading, really reading into, not just reading, but reading into what all these women on these forums were doing. And I'm like, why are they doing this? You know, the, the, these are all guidelines that bodybuilders had set up and you know, that's like a whole different realm compared to what bigger competitors are. Um, so why are these women following these these guidelines set up by male bodybuilders? And I sort of stepped back and said, well, 
what if I didn't do this? What if I just adhered to a healthy lifestyle and maintained it year round rather than doing that that panic of, oh, I have three months to get on stage, I'm gonna kill myself. Right. And so that was sort of my second epiphany or turning point. Okay. So um what with that all said, once you made those changes, what training changes did you make and nutrition changes did you make like tactically if you will um i was still sort of stuck in that that whole you know do 12 exercises a workout right. type thing for a while um until and in fact i did another show on my own and though i felt better and i was eating more um, i was still pretty tiny my second show i was like 119 when i got on stage uh, so I was having a hard time putting on muscle. I was doing well at maintaining my weight and eating more, but I was having a hard time putting on muscle. And that's when I hired Brett, who um, he was a strength coach. So it was just a different approach. He had worked with bigger girls before, mm -hmm. but he took it as, you know, the only way that you're going to put on muscle is you have to get stronger. And he tapered down my volume immensely, and he worked on – um, getting me stronger and you know doing more squats and deadlifts and working on form and I transformed like almost immediately like within four weeks like my body looked totally different awesome so that was sort of like the light bulb went on and was like oh okay so it's not about how much you do but how efficiently you work right and so that was sort of you know a, my revelation of, and my introduction into strength training so before I was kind of doing the bodybuilder right. split routines and then he put me on full body and upper and lower body splits and really cut back on my volume and that was like like my physique just transforms immediately. Now, now for those who don't know, I know who he is, but for those who don't know, who is Brett? Um, Brett is, he's known around, he's, I don't know, he wears many hats. So he's known as the glue guy, and he's sort of um, come up with this probably like cutting edge strategy for building glutes and getting your glutes strong. But um, he's also heavily in depth in the research side of strength training. So um, I don't think there's anything that he doesn't study and he's not interested in. He runs a website. Um, he's a pretty prolific writer on T Nation. And he's also... Um, the co-author of Strong Curves. So he came up with this program, Strong Curves, and he invited me to write the book with him. And so there's my book plug. <laughs> How is that coming along? Good. Um, we actually sort of turned the book, we doubled the book okay. over recent months. And um, so it's twice the, twice the size, and it's going to come out in April, and it's really just going to be like hopefully the go-to manual for female strength training. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I came across, I want to talk about this. I came across an article you wrote for uh, Tony Gentlecore called A House Divided. Do you remember that article? Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it was an awesome article. And part of it, the one quote that like really resonated me, with me was where you said, I don't want to live a little, I want to live to the fullest. And that, Like I said, that resonates with me. I can't tell you how much it... Uh, speaks with what I'm trying to spread with the art of physical fitness, the message I'm trying to spread. So um, could you perhaps go a little further into what you're talking about in that article and uh, the message you're trying to give to other to women? Yeah, um, I kind of, I wrote that article um, in, sort of in a response to the fact that a, a lot of my immediate family members had, you know, all these illnesses and, and they were band-aided by the medical community. So it, rather than addressing you know, the lifestyle issues that could lead up to these illnesses, they were just undergoing all these treatments and going on medication, and nobody was addressing you know, the underlying issue of, well, we need to help you make these lifestyle changes. And I think for a lot of people who get so far out of shape, I guess, or out right. of health, um, it's very, very difficult to take those initial steps. You know, for people like you and I, it's easy for us. Like, right. it's just part of our life. Like, you know, 
no, I can wake up every day and go to the gym and make a healthy breakfast and not eat fast food and make all these, you know, choices. Whereas somebody who's overweight and out of shape and who's gone through cancer and depression and all these different things, it's not easy and they're not getting those tools from their physician. So this was sort of like an outcry of um, feeling helpless. And, when, and that statement that I made is really um, sort of saying that I'm, I want, I, every day that I live is to make my life easier when I'm older. Whereas if you see, you know, this extreme end of fitness where they're going to kill themselves to look good and to, to be sort of the, the ideal of fit, even though technically inside, you know, they're aging themselves rapidly. Right. To the other extreme is somebody who doesn't ever work out, who, who doesn't make healthy food choices, you know, so I kind of measure those, those two extremes as kind of equal. You know, it's like either you're killing yourself by by overdoing it, or you're killing yourself by underdoing it. And so my message was, you have to find that balance and and be that medium to say, you know, there's there's got to be the right education coming from towards either sides to sort of say, you know, this is the way to do it. Right. <laughs> you're, you can't underdo it or overdo it. Are you familiar with, uh, do you read much? I do. <laughs> Are you familiar with, uh, it's an old book, but Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins? Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite books. I, I talk about it all the time, but it's one of my yeah. favorite books. And I mean, that really ties into what he, the message he tries to uh, get across is the, the, the differences between pain and pleasure and someone who's overweight and won't make the changes. Uh, those, how they're, in this case, they're seeing more pain to... They, they associate pain to eating the way that it will take the diet and exercising. They see more pain in that than the pleasure of not having, developing heart diseases and cancers and all that type of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's a thing I've saw I know you're, in the article you're talking about it with your mom. This is something I've seen with people, uh, individuals in my family. And a lot of it comes down to is I'm the, I'm the youngest in my family, so I'm trying to give advice as they still see me as a little five-year-old kid running around with curly hair, but um, now it's yeah. nothing much is there. But um, so it's, I get, I don't know if it requires for them to have an outside source come into them for them to be able to, because uh, they just can't take you seriously because you're their younger child, you're their child and they'll always see you as their baby. I'm not, I'm not sure how much that plays uh, a part in it or if, in, or if there's something where we need to bring outside help in with our family members, even though we, we know what they need to do, but to actually get them to pull the trigger on doing the things that they need to find some outside inspiration to be able to um, ignite the fire, if you will. Yeah, and I think um, just finding that drive, you know, like it's so much easier to go home and eat a bowl of macaroni and cheese than right. to, you know, prepare like to roast a chicken with vegetables and you know so it's when you're caught up in that lifestyle it's just you want you want easy and you want immediate you know rather than and I think too like we're we're kind of junkies for um, instant gratification right so just the whole mentality of oh my gosh I'm 40 pounds overweight you know that sticks in their head like I have to lose 40 pounds and that seems almost impossible to where rather than okay well I'm going to you know cut out bread right. and walk 20 minutes a day yeah like the slow a lot steps of over have time the mentality of, of taking those baby steps right um, and I just also think you know in the medical community I think it's becoming more prevalent to offer nutritional support but you know when my mom had cancer 10 years ago there was the only discussion of nutrition was her physician said, "Well, don't don't eat soy anymore because soy right. is you know a phytoestrogen." So my mother has never touched soy in the past ten years, but that's but she's she's not getting any healthier. Right. So and it's, you know, she's, go ahead. Um, it's just having that realization that you know you can bandy things with med medication. But you're not getting any better, right? I, I think a lot of people don't 
connect those two dots. Yeah, and like going back to what you're saying about your mom and the doctor, I mean, that's a lot of the thing is these people, they keep on getting conflicting. Now, research is always developing and changing, but really the human body hasn't changed. And But the general public who doesn't know any better keeps on getting these conflicting ideas. Ten years ago, it was fats were bad, and now all of a sudden carbs are bad. And then it's just there's no set idea of a way to approach it. And so there's too much confusion. And so they just, you know, give up on it because they don't want to take the time to figure it out. Yeah, it's like how many fad diets can you try? Right. I know for her, um, years ago before she was diagnosed, she was very successful on Atkins, but you know she had a lot of the side effects that people reported from that, from from the lack of nutrients, like you know cramping from the lack of potassium, and um, you know so you get off a diet like that and you go back to normal and you start putting the weight back on, and um, I think that there's sort of I don't know, like this this white space that people have where they don't they're they're active and healthy and then there's like these years of like thing like I don't know, where they don't recognize the fact that they're they're losing that and then all of a sudden they're they wake up and they're like, Holy cow, what happened? Right. You know, where did where did this young, vibrant, active person go? And it's actually slowly been happening over time. It's not overnight. Yeah. Um so I think a lot of people just have to get to that point where they're so uncomfortable with who they are. They have this major health scare to, you know, to sort of kick their butt in here. And it doesn't always work that, like that. Yeah. Back to that pain and pleasure thing. I mean, this happened with my dad. He He's not at risk for anything, uh, but he went to a doctor. It might have been a year ago or so. And they were telling him that he's at risk for his blood pressure and everything. For the, And I can't remember everything, that, but he was on borderline for some things. And um, that scare prompted him to make some changes. Now he made some changes. I don't know if he's, it doesn't seem like he's still adhering to it as much as he was, but for the first couple months after the doctor told this to him, that little scare kind of made him change the ways and he went back to his doctor and he saw some improvements in his blood profile. Um, so yeah, that's that, getting that kind of shock to the system, that pain of, you know, all of a sudden, wow, it's not gonna, cause they, it was like, oh, I'm gonna eat this donut. I'm gonna eat this, whatever, whatever the food is. It's, bad form or ha bad habit not exercising or whatever you're like it's not gonna it's same thing with smokers it's like it's not gonna affect me until the future until the future comes and now you're like all oh, right um i'm at risk here I, this is the point that i was thinking it was just put off in the distance so far off now it's upon me and i gotta start making some changes yeah so yeah and um i think a lot of it is that you know people people that are really busy and in their career and they don't want to have to think about anything else. So when you have to put a lot of thought into working out and eating well, it's just too overwhelming. And right. I think that's a lot of the reason why people tend to fall out of it is that it's, it is, it, it can be overwhelming, especially with all, like you said, all the information out there and all these bad diets and bad workouts. And, um, I always tell people just, do what you know you will enjoy. You know, you don't right. have to lift weights or, you know, take Zumba or go to spin class. Right. If you know you're not going to show up every day. Yeah. Find something that you will enjoy and you can, it can be as simple as buying a TRX for your house or whatever and, mm -hmm. and just stick with it. Yeah. Do it three times a week for 20 minutes and realize that you don't have to work out two hours a day to see results. Right. I mean, the options are endless, like what you're talking about. There's, you can, I mean, for me, my, my love is barbell work, squatting, deadlifting, all that yeah. stuff, but I'll still do plenty of gymnastics work, and then days I'll go out to playgrounds, and when kids aren't around, I don't want to be that creepy guy working out on the playground set <laughs> when kids are around, but running there, do pull-ups, sprints in the fields, and then there, and, but then there's also other, I mean, it's endless. You can go swimming, hiking, biking, uh, mountain climbing, uh, I'm sure we can we could come up with an endless list of physical activity that you can yeah. do that's going to help you that you don't have to if I mean some people they just need to change a focus all I think they need a direction they'll go in like and they have to think they all they can do is th these machines and they get just get bored by the machines and but for them there's no other option they're scared to approach a barbell or dumbbells because um, they it just seems like sitting there working on a machine is much safer but yet it's to them it gets boring and so yeah absolutely yeah there is there is always that fear and about not knowing how to lift weights right um 
And I know for a lot of people, they're very uncomfortable in a gym, you know, because they're out of shape and they don't quite know how to use the equipment. And it can be intimidating. So um, you, you don't have to go to a gym, but you have to find that one thing that you love or those two things that you really love and just do it. Like set aside that time, look at your schedule and think, okay, how many hours a week do I watch TV or do I do I hang out on the internet or, you know, how much time do I waste every week? Right. And just find those thoughts in that time. Like, okay, well, rather than, you know, watching the daily show every night or something, I'm going to take three of those nights and do a 20 minute workout. You know, it's just making that space for yourself and realizing that it's, it's not 10 hours a week. Right. You know, it could be two hours a week. Right. And that's why I like, even though I mean, me owning my own gym, so it's not really a big issue for me and I'm just addicted to training. But for other people, it might be tough. I'm a big supporter of getting stuff to have your own home gym, whatever it may be, kettlebells, barbells, gymnastics type equipment. Uh, just going out to Home Depot. Home Depot is like the best weightlifting equipment that you can find around if you're creative yeah. enough. But um, I mean, just creating your own home gym, that puts it right in front of your face and uh, you put it in a spot where you're walking by it every day or you have to walk around it, it kind of reminds you, hey, I got to work out today. Or even if you do something, you can put, if, I mean, not, I'm not that big of a watcher of TV. Um, I, might, I might watch an hour a day if that, and that's if I'm with like my favorite team, Cincinnati Reds are on playing baseball. Uh, I might watch part of that game, but really I'm not that big of a TV watcher. But if, if that's what you need to kind of keep yourself interested in it, uh, exercising around your TV can keep you engaged in the work without really thinking that you're working out too much. Right. Yeah. Or even, you know, Netflix has videos that you can download and, and participate in. And there, yeah, there's so many options. So, I did not know um, what are these? I did not know that about Netflix. What, what are these videos that is yeah, normal? They, well, they have um, workout videos, they have yoga videos. So, there's a lot of different options that you have, um, you know, and they have all these like P90X and insane, okay. you know, anything that you can, I, I think my brother um, does insanity through Netflix. So yeah, if you have time to watch TV, you definitely have time to exercise and whether that's putting your stationary bike in front of the TV or pacing in circles around your living room while, you know, your talk show is on, it doesn't matter. Right. It's just get up and get moving. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, thought I had just passed by me. Um, so I wanted to go back to something kind of off topic, but still on topic, something you were talking about way at the beginning, about this powerlifting gym you were training at. What, what was the name of that gym? Oh, it was World Gym in Fort okay. Myers. And um, it was started, it had been around forever, and it was right. great because the clientele, most of them had been there since the beginning. It was such yeah. a community, and... The gentleman that owned it used to be a competitive power lifter. He was mm -hmm. retired, but he would still get in there with those young guys and right. on the bench, and he was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that was really my first exposure to um, heavy training mm -hmm. because all the gyms I had gone to before were more like, you know, the fit moms or yeah. the bodybuilder type that would do high reps and, you know, a lot of isolation movements. Right. So here I saw these guys doing like reverse hypers and front squats and right. hack squats and all these things I had never seen before. And it was just so like, it really opened up my mind to sort of explore this side of strength training and I just fell in love. Yeah. Yeah. Same, similar to me. I, when I was in high school, started training, I went, there was a place in town called Power Station. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you know, they have a, I don't know if you know the name Mike Ferguson. That sounds okay. Well, he, he actually it's called Power State. The gym's been around. It's one of those hardcore powerlifting gyms. There's powerlifters, bodybuilders. He's an ex like Marine and Sheriff, the guy who owns the place. But um, he has a powerlifting um, competition that just happened around here maybe two or three weeks ago. That was um, a lot of the other guy, a lot of the guys, Brian Schwab, if you know him. I'm not sure if you know much of the powerlifting circle, but um, yeah, but back to that, the gym. Like it was just like you're saying when I was there I mean I was 15 something like that and there was these big dudes lifting weights with these sh weird shirts on 
powerlifting <laughs> shirts. I, I didn't know what they were doing, screaming, <laughs> chalk on their hands and stuff. But I felt I fell in love with it. I ate it all up. But it was surreal at the time compared to because before that I was just training at some normal uh, not twenty. It was twenty four hour fit. It was around at the time, but it was a twenty four hour gym where yeah. you know real clean chrome equipment if you will and then i go to this place yeah. chalk all over the place guys grunting loud music going on bodybuilders and uh, power lifters all around it was and that just really is what ignited me to um, to get me going into it that really like struck a chord with me for uh, my yeah. passion that i have for it that's good yeah it's always nice to sort of walk into this you know not not really seeking it out and almost not knowing that it exists and then sort of walking in and realizing like, huh, I'm home. This is exactly where right. I need to be. Yeah. But it's definitely an area that a gym where a lot of people could, uh, um, get, uh, intimidated by it. Definitely not something yeah. for, I mean, for you, from your coming from your point of view, especially for a lady moon, a guy screaming, yelling, lifting heavy weights. That's kind of like what we're, drilled into our mind and society that we're supposed to do anyway so it's kind of feeling at home but for a girl it's 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 different yeah and he actually um he had the gym set up very smart the front of the the room there was like a front room where all the standard equipment was and um you know all the cardio and and machines and some benches and squat racks right. and then like way in the back in this closed off room with the door shut with all the power lifters and they would go in there and they'd shut the door and they'd blare their like screamo music and right. you know like they do their thing and you know that they were in there and sometimes they'd come out and train in the regular room but right. it's just you know they sometimes they leave the door open and you can see what they were doing and um, yeah it was just really inspiring to sort of have this they, there weren't any women in their group at the time I don't know there might be now but um they weren't elitist at all. Like they were very inviting, and you know they didn't think they owned the gym, um, so it was pretty cool. Like they they were down to earth. You can go talk to them and ask them questions, and it was pretty cool. Awesome. So now is the time. I, w I want you to just boast about yourself. What <laughs> what are some of your best lifts in the gym? Uh, I it's funny. Like I used to really be into getting stronger, and I wanted to like max out my deadlift. And right um, now I'm sort of more exploring and like learning different things. Like I bought kettlebells, so I'm learning those. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I I maxed my deadlift at like 285 forever ago. I haven't really worked on that. Um, right. I maxed my squat at 185, and that's a full range. It was a no half squat. <laughs> Um, right now I'm kind of working on, on my my hip thrust and my glute bridge. So I maxed my right. glute bridge at 435. And my hip thrust was, I don't know, like 365. I'm going to go for 400 with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I haven't really been like training super heavy. I've never had a strong upper body. Like my bench press is sad. Right. I think, I think I maxed it at like 115 or something and gave up. So do you bench much or what do you do for your upper body? Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I've been doing a lot of kettlebells, um, you know, kettlebells, cleans, presses, mm -hmm. socks, press is like one of my new favorite things. That's like killer. Um, yeah. Shoulder presses, pull-ups, rows, floor presses. So I, I do a lot of variety with my... Um, upper body, but I don't necessarily go for you know those singles and triples like I right. used to. I just gave up on yeah. that. Yeah. Did it beat you up, or just going to enjoy it, or you just no, wanted to I try something new? No, I just felt. Um, I guess maybe because I trained by myself, I felt that I wasn't really able to push to the limits, and I got right. to the point you know where I sort of maxed out with my singles and like if I didn't have anybody else around spotting me I, I chickened out so I still right. enjoy you know lifting upper body I just do it more for I don't know for fun than you know trying to push for those heavy goals now you're gonna kind of going off topic again but still on topic uh, are you gonna be competing anytime soon no I toy with that my last show was a year ago and I worked okay. with um, Alan Argon with nutrition, 
And right. he told him, like, if I don't get my pro card, I was doing the OCB uh, pro qualifier. I said, I think I'm done. Like, you know, if I don't go pro, like, I think I'm done. And I placed fourth, and I didn't win my pro card. And I just, I sort of looked back and realized, you know, that I wanted to pursue other things in fitness and sort of work on the writing side and start right. working with clients and all that. So I get that itch. And I'm always, you know, kind of to the point where, like, in six weeks, I could always walk on stage if I wanted to. Right. Um, but I haven't had, you know, I haven't had that innate drive that says, okay, you've got to do this again. So I might, I might find that, you know, in a year from now or whatever. But right now, I don't really have that itch. Okay. Uh, one last question I had for you uh, that I wanted to cover. Do you, what type of nutritional plan do you follow? Do you follow anything that, like a lot of the, not fat, I don't think they're, they're fads because they're popular now, but at the same time, I think that they have merit, like intermittent fasting and carb yeah. backloading. But do you follow anything like that or do you just eat clean and that's your life or what do you do? Um, I find that it's, for me, I'm an intuitive eater and I know a lot of women can't do this. A lot of people can't do this because um, eating can become so emotional that you know, your intuition kind of throws you off. Um, but for me, like, if I try intermittent fasting or carb backloading or whatever, it works sometimes and it doesn't work other times. So for me, I can some days wake up and not eat until 2 o'clock and be totally fine. And it's nothing intentional. It's just I'm listening to my hunger and whether or not it's there. Right. And other times I wake up and I'm, like, ravenous at 9 in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I don't ever want my eating to become a distraction. Right. And sometimes I find when you would keep like intermittent fasting or any of these other things, eating can become Sorry distracting. Sorry about that. I have one of those too. I'm like, please let the <laughs> mail come early so he doesn't park. <laughs> um, and I know that doesn't work for everybody. A lot of people need, they need that goal and they need that plan and they need to weigh their food and measure every day. And for me, I, yeah. I it drives me crazy if I have to think yeah. too much about eating. Yeah. I used to be the same way. I used to like count everything every day, tracked all my calories, and then just got to a point of craziness. And um, then I just I just eat, like you are saying, what I, I know the right choices to make, and I eat them when I do. I don't count calories or anything. I don't really even count any of my carbs, proteins, or anything. I just eat. Yeah. And then occasionally I'll intermittent fast if it – more than my schedule dictates it, especially with – kind of keeps me from doing it, those type of things, a little more full stream, because I'm training athletes. The more, majority of my day is actually in the evening. That's when kids are out of school and when I'm training them. So I can't really, the ideas of those programs is you're eating in the afternoon, so I don't have the time. And so I just, on days I can, I'll fast a little bit. On days I can, I'll eat when I can. And it's just that type of approach where it just fits the life instead of trying to have the diet fit me. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing I definitely, don't do is you know the five or six meals eating every two to three hours right i i did that you know when i first started because that's what everybody was doing and i just yeah i started thinking well <laughs> this is weird but i started thinking about you know like the animal kingdom and you know like how many times a day do lions eat how many times a day do i feed my dog or my fish and my right that'd be crazy if i fed my dog six times a day you know like it was a weird thought process, but I felt like... And your dog is ripped, probably, I would guess. Huh? And your dog is probably ripped to shreds, I would guess, oh, and they yeah, only eat twice totally. a day. Yeah, yeah, he would love eating five times a day if I liked <laughs> But, um, so I'm like, you know, thinking my digestion is never resting, and I'm, I'm right. eating when I'm not hungry, and, you know, so I sort of said, well, what if I just eat when I'm hungry? And I started doing that, and I just felt so much better, um... And as far as like macronutrients and counting calories and stuff, um, I don't do that either. I guess because I've sort of learned what works for me and I can right. I cook so much that I'm really good at like eyeballing portions and stuff like that. But I do sometimes get to the point like, okay, I'm, I'm like I'm retaining a lot of water or I put on a few pounds. And so I will take a couple of days and start writing down what I'm eating and so I can evaluate like what's causing this. But yeah. other than that, I'm, you know, I'm, I, and I guess I'm good at saying, okay, well, you had a couple of glasses of wine and some cake for dinner 
last night. You know, I keep that in my head so I don't do that every night, you know. Right, yeah. It's all push and a pull aspect. Yeah. You know, preparing yourself. I mean, yeah, I don't strict. I don't, you probably did it just like you're describing your past where you limited yourself when you're out with friends or during holidays and stuff and limited yourself eating wise. And that just eventually that just weighs on you and you want to take part in stuff. I mean, I'm not saying overindulge, but I mean, I'll have come Christmas time when my mom makes my mom loves to bake and she's making all these cookies. And I don't know if you know what Buckeyes are, but oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so she makes all this stuff. I love the Buckeyes. Yes. And so, I mean, but I adjust my diet accordingly and my training accordingly and everything to coincide with it so I can still have my cake and eat it too, literally and figuratively. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with that. So you have to, you have to get to that point. You know, it, it's, it's not immediate. You can't be 30 pounds overweight and, you know, do what we do. I think you have to sort of get to that point of understanding how your body responds to food and what you can and cannot eat and how much of what you can eat. So it is definitely a learned process, you know, like for, right. for you and I, it, it is intuitive. Like we understand our body. We know when we don't feel good and why we don't feel good and how to change that. Right. But for a lot of people struggling with weight issues, um, I think they do have to track and they do have to measure until they really understand, you know, what's going on and what works and what doesn't. Right. Well, outstanding. Um, that's all I had. I just want to, do you want to talk about your book just a little bit more? Or do you want to, again, when does it come out? Yeah. Um, so I wrote, I co-authored Strong Curves with Brett Contreras. And it's a female strength training book, but it's really about um, improving body composition and really mm -hmm. working on those curves, like we say. Um, right. And it's a lot of emphasis on building a great butt. So every woman wants... Um, because Brett has worked with primarily women. He's just been blessed mm -hmm. with that, <laughs> that clientele. Um, <laughs> and he's come up with this phenomenal program that works on transforming the female physique. Um, you know, and I was one of, one of his most successful clients because I adhered to everything he taught me. And right. um, being that I had a writing background, he kind of pulled me on board with the project. So basically you've got your, we have, four different programs in it, and they're all 12-week programs. So we have a, a beginner, intermediate, advanced, and then, no, I'm sorry, a beginner, um, advanced, body weight, and glute-only workout. So you have all mm -hmm. these different options in there. Each program is 12 weeks, and it's all progressive. Um, we have a nutritional guideline. It's not necessarily a, you know, a diet, but it sort of gives you a nutritional guideline. And then in the back of the book, we have an entire exercise index with about 260 exercises. They're all okay. um, full colored photos with detailed description on how to do the exercises um, as well. So it's sort of an exercise Bible like thrown in the back of this book. So you never get bored. There's the program that has the exercises in it and then we teach you how to go in the back of the book and pull out different exercises and design your own program. So I, I think it's really unique. Um, you know, there's not many books out there that offer this. And it comes out April 2nd, so we're really excited for that. And you, where could you get it when it comes out? Can you pre-order it at all? Yeah, so right now um, you can go to Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com and pre-order the book. Um, okay. And it's just sitting there waiting for you. <laughs> Uh, I'll put a link down below the video when this gets posted, yep. and uh, so that they can both Bar does Bar Barnes and Noble has it online, right? You said Barnes and Noble and Amazon. A Amazon, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, post a link so people, if anyone interested in uh, getting that pre-ordered, so it gets to you on the date, April second. You said. Yep. All right. Um, so, any final thoughts? No, any final I, things you I want to really express? I really appreciate now? you having me. This is my first video interview, so. Um, oh, it was my pleasure. It's great to have yeah, you on. Yeah, thanks so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this was Kyle from The Art of Physical Fitness with Kelly Davis. And until uh, next time, I want to thank you for stopping by. Thank Bye. you. Yo, VIP.